Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining me today in this session about uh, Micronaut. Uh, before I start with, and with the session, a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you know anything about Micronaut? Can you please raise your hands? OK, perfect. So all of you are going to learn something new today. Excellent. Uh, so let me introduce myself very quickly, and then we can, we can start. I'm Ivan Lopez, Ilomar on Twitter. Uh, I'm from Madrid, from Spain, and I work at Object Computing. OCI is the company uh, behind both Grails and Micronaut frameworks. I'm part of the development team of, of both frameworks. I'm also um, the organizer of the Groovy user group in Madrid, and I also am a regular speaker at different conferences. And that's all I'm going to talk about me today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to explain what is Micronaut in something like two slides, and then I'm going to switch to the IDE, and I'm going to show you all the things that we can do in something like 40 minutes with the framework. So Micronaut is a framework uh, for developing microservices in the JVM. It's been created from scratch, uh, with all the lessons we've, we've learned uh, for creating, maintaining, and developing Grails for, all, for more than 10 years. Uh, if you don't know Grails, Grails is a full stack framework built on top of a Spring Boot. So Grails creator, Graham Roche, created also Micronaut with all the experience in mind and focused only on microservices. It's ultra lightweight, it's react reactive, it's based on Netty, uh, but you don't need to use, um, if you don't want, you don't need to use the, or to follow a reactive approach when you develop your applications. You can do it the same way you do now. And you can choose the three main languages for the JVM. So you can develop your applications with Java, Groovy, and, and Kotlin. And the key, one of the key features about Micronaut is this ahead of time compilation. If you know uh, frameworks, uh, annotation frameworks, annotation based frameworks like, for example, Spring, uh, when you start up a Spring application, what the framework needs to do is pretty much read all your code or all, all the, sorry, the bytecode, all the classes, analyze every time you put an at service, at component, at whatever, and the framework needs to uh, do that when, when, start, when you start the application and cache all that information in memory because the framework needs to really understand your, your application to do something like dependency injection. And, and the framework does that at runtime when you start your application. So when you have an application that it's not something like a hello world, you have a real application, that takes time because the framework needs to read all your beans, all your code, and cache all that information into memory, right? So when you have a mid-size application, that takes time and also takes more memory because of that. So Micronaut does exactly the same, but instead of doing that at runtime, it does some compilation time meaning that when you start your application, everything is already pre-computed, everything is already there. So the framework pretty much oh, doesn't need to do pretty much anything when, when the application starts, because all the meta information uh, that the framework needs, it's already there in, 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 the, in companion classes, right? And this is one of the key features. Uh, this means that the framework doesn't use reflection, there is no runtime proxies, no dynamic class loading, nothing, nothing like that, because everything is computed ahead of time. And, and with these two features, we achieve a lot of things. Uh, so we have really, really fast startups. It doesn't matter if you have a Hello World application on a real application with hundreds of beans. It, it doesn't matter because all the information is already there. The memory footprint is really low because, as I said, everything is pre-computed, so we don't need to cache everything into memory. And we like to, to use this, this word, this natively cloud native, because when you develop a framework for microservices in 2019 or 2018, uh, you need to provide developers a lot of things, like service discovery, distributed tracing, uh, if you know about these 12-factor apps, uh, externalized configuration. All of that is provided by the framework, so you don't need to worry about it. And it also fits really well in this serviceless, serviceless approach uh, because uh, all this, especially because of the fast startup and low memory consumption. Uh, so if you develop this on something like AWS Lambda, uh, you don't need to pay or you don't want to pay too much money because your, your application takes too much time to start up. Uh, of course, we do support GraalVM. Uh, if you know about it, it's, um, it's a new um, JVM, it's a new um, um, polyglot JVM from Oracle. I will show you uh, how it works in the demo. And Micronaut is open source, uh, Apache 2 license, so you don't have any issues. We released 1.1 in October last year, and we have released more than 20 releases since uh, that date. Uh, last one was 1.1.2 that we released last week. 
and we have something like 150 contributors. Uh, 17 are from OCI, and the rest are community contributions. We have received a lot of pull requests. A lot of great feeders came from the community, and we, we receive pull requests pretty much every day. So that's all. This is pretty much my last slide. So now I'm going to show you how you can all the things you can do uh, with Micronaut. So if you want to install Micronaut, we provide a CLI. It's not mandatory, but it's really helpful to create the skeleton for your application. So the easiest way uh, to install Micronaut is using SDK Manager. If you don't know it, uh, you can take a look later. It's a tool or a toolkit for basically manage any SDK, Java, Kotlin, Groovy, uh, Micronaut, Spring Boot. You can switch from different version is pretty useful. So I already have installed the latest version. Uh, we have an interactive CLI with auto-completion, a lot of things. And I'm going to show you here um, two commands. The first one is list profiles. Uh, so we have a specific profiles um, for creating different applications. So if you want to create uh, an application for G using gRPC, we have a, a profile or, or for Kafka or only RabbitMQ, or even to deploy something to AWS Lambda. And then we have the service, which is some kind of the default. So I'm going to show you now profile service. And here you can see all the, all the commands that we uh, provide. So once you create an application with this profile, you can say MN, create controller, or create bin, and, and, and uh, the framework will create the skeleton for you if you want. And we have all these features. There are uh, configurations that we provide out of the box for you to integrate with all these uh, external parties. So if you want to use uh, discovery, con discovery service with Consulot with, with Eureka, uh, you can use Flyway for your database migrations, uh, Hibernate with Gorm or JBA, uh, different uh, data sources uh, pool. We have uh, LiquidBase also for database migrations, uh, management endpoints to get the health status of your app, uh, Micrometeor, Micrometer, uh, with a lot of different backends, and in 1.2, we are going to, uh, to release something like eight more uh, backends. All, all, all of them are community contributed. We have support for uh, Mongo Reactive Driver, Neo4j Reactive Driver, different Netflix integrations, uh, Postgres Reactive, RabbitMQ, Swagger Tracing. So as you can see, plenty of different options for you out of the box, and we add more and more in every release. So if you want to create an application, uh, you can say create app, encrypt. Uh, service, and then you can pass any features here you want. The only, one, the only feature I'm going to pass is Spock, because by default, Micronaut will create a Java application built with Gradle. Uh, if you want to use Maven, you can. And if you want to use Kotlin or Groovy, you can, you can pass that, that language feature. And uh, by default, as it is Java, it uses a unit 5. But I do prefer to use um, Spock, because for me, it's way too better. So let's open the application on the IDE. And let's see what we can do. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to create a controller, create controller. So this is going to be a controller. If you know, uh, how many of you are uh, Spring developers? OK, so all of the Spring developers will find this that is pretty much the same they are used to, to do, because we wanted to, to create something that is very natural for Spring developers. Uh, as I said, Grails is built on top of a Spring. We use a Spring for a lot of years. We like it. So we try to follow the same approach. So I'm going to, uh, to map this to the end URI. Um, what I'm going to do is expose a get endpoint, encrypt text. And I'm going to create public my message, encrypt string text. Let's create this. So I'm using uh, Java without anything. So uh, I need to I I need a a, con, an, a constructor. I also need an empty constructor, and I need also uh, getters and setters. If you use uh, Lombok, you can get rid of all of this boilerplate. If you use uh, Kotlin or Groovy, you can also get rid of all of th all of this. I'm using play Java, so I need to live with this. And now. As I don't have too much time here for do a properly encryption, uh, what I'm going to do uh, is to uh, basically this is going to be my encryption, right? I'm going to just reverse the um, the string. 
So let's return here, new my message, encrypted, right? So we already have our backend. So what I'm going to do now, um, because we want to test our code, right? Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to create a new class, an interface, encrypt client. And here I'm going to use that client annotation and I'm going to map to the same, the same URI as I use in the, in, the, uh, in the controller. So this is the backend, this is the HTTP client. I'm going to use the same signature. And what Micronaut is going to do is going to implement this interface for me uh, or for us at compile time. So we don't need to worry about uh, implementing our own HTTP client. And now I have both of them. What I'm going to do now is create a class, a, a test. So um, encrypt controller spec. Uh, this is a um, Spock test, so I need to extend from a specification. And I'm going to annotate it with a micronaut test. Uh, this annotation, so you can use this annotation for both JUnit 5 and, and Spock. What this annotation does is, uh, it provides uh, pretty much everything you need to do. So it creates an embedded server to, to do that. It will start the embedded server to run all your tests. It will make sure that you can, that uh, the embedded server and the context is stop after you finish all your tests. And it will take care of everything. So the only thing I need to do with, with this at Micronaut annotation, it's define my, my encryption client. And now what I can do is test and write my test, encrypt controller. And the test is going to be pretty simple because I only expect that when I call my encrypt test with something like hello J prime, remember that this returns a pollo, so I will get the text. The test should be something like uh, this. No, this, uh, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. So let's run the test. I think I, I missed something. Okay, it's green, perfect. And as you can see here, uh, 589 milliseconds. Uh, so this is not a unit test. This is a full end-to-end -end integration test. Uh, this annotation and Micronaut will uh, bootstrap a, an application context and will do an HTTP call, uh, a real integration test. So what I'm going to do, because you don't probably believe me, I'm going to duplicate this. And here in my logback configuration, um, I'm going to enable, I'm going to set the trace, I'm, the HTTP client I'm going to set to trace level so we can see all the, all the, all the, all the chains. So the first one, again, 580 something milliseconds, the second one, 19. And you can see here the full, uh, all the calls. So sending a request, encrypt hello J prime, chosen server local host here. By default, Micronaut will start on port 8080, but when you start on test, it will start on a random port because you don't need to worry about, about anything else. And you can see accept application JSON, client response, uh, 200, and you can see here response body and the text, right? Uh, so we return, here in the controller, we return a, a pollo because that's what we do when we, when we use Java. But Micronaut under the hood is using, um, what's the name? Jackson, sorry, to serialize everything uh, to JSON. So that's why you can see here the JSON. And as you can see, the first test, the first test took something like 500 milliseconds, and pretty much all this time is because of uh, the JVM class loading. But the second one only took 19 milliseconds to run a full end-to-end -end integration test, right? And this is probably the pattern that you will have in more of your tests. You have one class with different classes, sorry, different tests inside this class. So you can see that you can um, write integration tests most of the time because uh, you don't need to wait too much uh, because sometimes I'm not saying that we shouldn't write unit tests. Unit, te unit, unit tests are useful, but sometimes we don't write unit tests because, sorry, we we don't write integration tests and we write unit tests because writing an integration text test mix means that we need to uh, start up the context and we need to wait something like 25 minutes until, sorry, 25 seconds until the, the context starts. So it's too much time and we prefer to do unit tests, even if we need to mock pretty much everything in our architecture to do that. So with Micronaut, uh, you don't have that problem because the, the integration test start up really, really fast. Okay, what else? So here I'm returning Apollo. Uh, so Micronaut is built on top of Netty, and if you know a little bit about Netty, 
you should know that you shouldn't block uh, the net even loop. It's not like Tomcat. In Tomcat, you have something like 100 threads, and every request, every request will get one thread. In Netty, you have something like four, eight, something like that, and you cannot block that net even loop. So as this uh, method is returning a, a blocking type, in this case, Apollo, Micronaut is smart enough to know that this code cannot be run on the net even loop, so Micronaut will move this code to another even loop to do not block uh, net even one. But if you want to make this code reactive and non-blocking, the only thing you need to do is return something, some uh, reactive type. So we support reactive streams, so you can use Rx Java, um, Project Reactor, pretty much anything that uh, implements uh, reactive streams. So I'm just returning a single of this, uh, of this message. I need to change uh, also the signature for my uh, client. And as you can see here, IntelliJ, now it's complaining because it doesn't know this get text. So the easiest way is to just call blocking get, which basically means uh, uh, the test is going to subscribe to that single to get the result. So the test pass again, right? It's important to write tests to make sure that you don't break anything when you are uh, doing changes. So uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is that here I'm putting my business logic uh, to encrypt this test. In, in a controller. And this is now how it's supposed to do, right? We don't put business logic on controllers because we don't, we don't, uh, we can't reutilize this code, reuse this code. So what I'm going to do, it's creating an encryption service. Annotate that singleton. I put here my code. And now on my controller, I just going to inject encryption service. And here I can just return encryption service, encrypt text. Come on. Let's run the test. So uh, if you are a Spring developer, this is exactly the same as you are doing. Here uh, I'm doing uh, constructor injection. Uh, the nice thing about doing constructor injection is that you can declare your dependencies as final and no one will be able to modify them. Uh, you saw here on the test that I use at inject. You have also that option if you want. For a test, it's fine to do at inject, uh, but for production code, this is a recommended approach. You can also use setter injection, but we don't recommend that, right? So this is the same as you are used to, but keep in mind that all this dependency injection is also pre-computed at compile time, as everything is inside, inside Micronaut. Right, so we have now this microservice, uh, and when we talk about microservices, we don't have only one, right? We, we want to, to have more than one, and, and we want to be able to discover different microservices. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add support for, um, uh, for console to use console as a, discovery ser as a discovery service. So I'm going to add here um, console, and I'm going to modify my application.yaml with the console configuration, which is this one. And I'm going to modify also here this server port minus one. Uh, with this, I'm saying uh, I don't want you to start on port 8080. You can start on any random port that is available because I want to be able to start more than one instance of my microservice. And here, what I'm saying is, by default, uh, console will be listening, or Micronaut will be looking for console in localhost 8500. But if you define console port or console host in any way, those are the values that will be used, right? So externalized configuration. Uh, so you don't need to worry about knowing all this stuff because if you create the application uh, using the feature console, everything will be there for you. And if not, you can go also to the documentation to take a look. So now I think I can start console here on Docker and I can run my application. Yeah, you can see it took, it took something like two seconds started on a random port. Let's start another instance. <coughs> okay. So we can go here to localhost 8500. And we can see we have here the both uh, two instances of our microservice, right? So we have now a microservice that encrypts text. And now we are going to create uh, another one because uh, when you have a microservice architecture, uh, you don't want to expose all your architecture to, to the clients, right? 
And one approach to, to do that is put something in the middle, some kind of gateway, and all the external clients will talk to this gateway, and the gateway will be responsible to talking to everyone here, right? And in this gateway, you, you uh, put something like authorization, uh, fallbacks, and a lot of things in that in this place. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this gateway um, microservice uh, to interact with, with this one. So MN, create app, let's call it gateway. And now I'm going to use uh, two features. The first one is Discovery Console. So this feeder will, uh, will add the same things that I modify manually, the dependency in, in Grader or, or Maven, and the configuration will be added by this feeder. And I'm also going to add tracing uh, Thipkin because we are going to use it later. Gateway idea, OK. <coughs> OK, we're good. So now, uh, what I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to create my gateway controller. I'm, and I want to expose, so this is going to be my, the entry point for, my, for all my microservices. So I want to expose this in API slash. And here, I'm going to do api.version colon v1, which means that if API.version is defined somewhere. That's the value that is going to be used. And if not, it will take v1 by default. So I'm not going to define that variable there. So uh, this will be exposed in API v1 by default. And now I'm going to cheat a little bit uh, because I don't want to type the same again and again. So I'm going to copy this. And also I'm going to copy this because I'm using, so I'm using here uh, the same POYO. And, I, and, and in this application, I'm going to use the HTTP client to, to communicate to the, to the other one. In a real-world application, what you should do is put in these two, these two classes that are shared between both projects in another project. So you will create a, a Maven or a Gradle multi-project build, and you will share that small jar in, in, in between the different microservices. But I don't have time to do that. So uh, now here, remember that I used this before, and I used for the test, but now what I'm going to do is I want to use this client for the microservices, microservices that it's called encrypt service, right? So now uh, when we start this application, Micronaut is going to use console and, and it's going to ask, okay, I want to know where encrypt service is, and console will return uh, the information for these two services on these random ports, and Micronaut will use that to communicate uh, to that microservice. So here. The only thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to inject my client, uh, encrypt client. Come on. And here, I just going to use it, encrypt text, right? So let's start this application. This is going to start on port 8080 because I haven't changed anything. OK, port 8080. And as you can see here, uh, the console uh, configuration is already there because I use the Discovery Console feature. And the, um, what is it? Yeah, here. The HTTP client, uh, sorry, the Discovery client, it's also here be because of that feature. So now that my application is up and running, I can send a request, localhost 8080, API v1, hello J Prime. Yeah, so you can see this is the row. And every time I reload the page, every time I, I send a new request, uh, what Micronaut is, what, what the HTTP client is doing, it's sending a request to one or the other of the microservices. By default, it's using a round robin policy, uh, but you cannot see that because the, the text is the same for both microservices. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to stop this. And I'm going to modify uh, my encryption service to show you, uh, I'm going to inject the embedded server, which is the server that all micro application has. And I'm going to modify the message to return here, embedded server get, get port, right? So we will be able to see the port on the response. So let's start the first one, 6500, um, and the second one, Come on. 
27359. So when I now when I reload the page, every time I reload the page, I get the response from one or the other. And this is, uh, as I said, out of the box. It's for free for you. So by default, uh, the HTTP client implements it, this low uh, round robin load load uh, load balancing policy. If you if you don't want that, the only thing you need to do is probably extend for, for that Micronaut class and replace with your own code or create a new bin that will replace the other one with implementation or with the policy that you want. But by default, you can see that it's a pretty nice default to have a wrong robin policy. OK? And then, now that we have this, uh, another thing that we also we always need to keep in mind when, when talking about microservices is that the network is going to fail, the microservices are going to be down, right? Because this is not a monolith, a, a monolith anymore. So we are going to implement a fallback on the gateway again to, to make sure that when, when one or when, ma when our microservices are down, we are not going to fail or we are not going to cascade all those errors and propagate all those errors through all our architecture. Uh, so this is useful because imagine a, a, an e-commerce website when you have um, an item, the, the users are want to buy something, and you put here, for example, on the bottom, a uh, recommendation, right? So other clients that bought this item also bought this one, right? Any of these. And, and this list probably came from a um, recommendation microservice. And if the, re if the recommendation microservice is down, you don't want to fail, right? You don't want to, to or, or you, what, do you, what you want is that the users will be able to buy that item, right? So you need to return as some kind of a fallback which probably will be an empty list of recommendations that won't be displayed on the UI, but the, the users will be able to buy your products. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to stop the gateway, and I'm going to do uh, in three steps. So, um, the first one, I'm going to extend encrypt operations. Let's create the interface, and I move here uh, the definition. So. This is just the interface, the common interface, and this one extends from the other one, and the only difference is that it's annotated with a client, so it's the same behavior as, as before. Now, on my gateway, I'm going to implement the new interface. And as you can see, nothing changed, because I was already implementing the same signature, but now you can see that IntelliJ knows that this is implemented, uh, this method is from encrypt operations, so everything is good. And the last thing is, I'm going to create a new class, Encrypt client fallback. The name is not is not important. I'm going to annotate it with a with a fallback. I also need to implement the interface. And now here, I need to return the fallback. Right? I need to uh, use the same method signature because this is the this is what is going to be used when when there is no uh, when there is a failure on the microservices. So I'm going to say here my message fallback. Right, so let's start the application again. Up and running. So if I reload, everything is still continue working because I haven't changed anything. But now I'm going to stop both instances. I'm going here, and instantaneously I have the fallback, right? There is no uh, 404 or 502 or whatever error. This is a 200, but this is a fallback something safe that won't break all your, all your microservices. And then if I restart my microservices, 47432 and 30-something. So you can see now, again, we have the real uh, response from the microservices. And we, in, uh, so besides using fallback, we provide more things like, for example, retry, retryable. And with this annotation, what you can configure is some kind of retry policy. So for example, I want to retry five for a, any number of atoms. I want to delay 500 milliseconds between atoms. This is my max, uh, maximum overall delay. Because sometimes, depending on your use case, maybe it's, uh, it's better to just wait something like 300 milliseconds and uh, retry the call again to the backend instead of returning the, the, the default, the fallback, right? So you can configure that with this at retrieval annotation. We also have circuit breaker. If you know uh, a little bit or anything about um, Netflix histories, this is the same. This implements the circuit breaking pattern. But 
without adding a new external dependency like, like Hystrix, right? So it's not as powerful as, as, as Hystrix, but depending on your use case, maybe it's enough for you. You can configure here, again, a lot of things. So you can say uh, the number of attempts before opening the, the, the circuit, the retries, the multiplier, a lot of different things to configure the circuit breaker. And maybe in your application, you don't need all the complexity that, that Netflix history adds. And you can just use a circuit breaker, which is built inside Micronaut with the same approach of doing and um, pre-computing everything at compile time. OK, so we have fallback. And the next thing I'm going to do uh, is adding uh, distributed tracing. Because when you have, imagine this example, you have the gateway. And this gateway is calling to encrypt microservice. But in, in a real world, you probably will have something like four different microservices. So you want to be able to trace that call through the different microservices to make sure that everything is working on where, or when something fails, you want to make sure that you can follow that path. So I added, when I created this gateway, uh, I added uh, support for, for Thipkin. So you can see here, here is the, the, uh, the support for Thipkin. And this is the configuration. The only thing I'm going to change is this, the probability. This sample probability means that you don't want to send all your requests to Thipkin, right? You want to only sample a little bit, something like 10%, 10% or 25% of your request to Thipkin. In this case, I'm going to send 100% because uh, I don't want to have to reload the page 10 times to make sure that it works. So uh, gateway is up, I'm running. And now uh, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to add to this application uh, the Thipkin support. So these are the dependencies. And let's put it here, the configuration. So let's start one instance. And I also need to um, open Thipkin. I'm using Docker again. <coughs> so it's take, it, this takes something like four seconds. OK, it's up and running, so we can check it here, Thipkin, right? So let's send a new request, hello with Thipkin. Right. It works. And if we reload this, we can see here the both microservices, and we can try to find here probably this one. Yeah, you can see uh, the gateway, and I API v1 encrypt hello with Thipkin, and the call to the backend, right? And the only thing I did uh, to add Thipkin support, as you saw, was adding the dependencies. And Micronaut will do best effort to make sure that uh, everything, every request is, is traced uh, in, in Thipkin. But sometimes um, you need to, or you want to have more control over that, over all this tracing. So we have a few uh, annotations. Let me close this uh, everything. Here, so you can say here new span, which means that every time this controller is hit, I'm going to start a new kind of transaction in Thipkin. And you can also say here span tag uh, plain text. And this, what this is going to do, let's restart it, is going to save on a Thipkin header the original text in this in this header inside Thipkin. So if I now uh, uh, with um, span, right? We can try to find here uh, the new request, probably this one. And I think here, yeah, you can see plain text, the text that I save, right? So you can use this span tag annotation to, for example, to trace the, your, your user ID or your account ID or whatever parameter that you want to have in Thipkin, because once you have something in Thipkin, you can, you can search for anything here, right? So Thipkin is really powerful. We also support uh, Jagger, uh, but I prefer to use this for, for the demo. And you can see here, for example, the dependencies, which I only have two of them. But if you have 10, once everything is hit, Thipkin will know about everything and will put here the nice drawing of, of all your microservices. OK, so now, uh, now that we have Thipkin support, what I'm going to talk a little bit is about GraalVM. Uh, how many of you know everything about GraalVM? OK, so three, four, OK. So GraalVM is a new polyglot uh, virtual machine from Oracle uh, that provides or that, yeah, that provides a different uh, just-in-time compiler. It's your 
regular Java 8, your open JDK, but with another uh, just-in-time compiler. Instead of using the default C2 that we've been using for a lot of years, we use this uh, just-in-time compiler called Graal. But inside the same kind of umbrella project, there is another thing uh, that allows us to, co to convert a Java application to a native image, a, a binary, a native binary for, for your OS. And that makes the application will start amazingly fast because it's just a binary like any other binary you have on, on, your, on your laptop, and it will use just a little, uh, just a few megabytes of memory. So uh, if you want to start with Graal, you can, you can say MN create, create app, and you can pass the feeder Graal native uh, image. And this will Hmm. So yeah, I need to put some name. So MN Graal, right? And this will create in this project will add all the information and all the configuration you need to do for Graal. So, but instead of doing this and start this application, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify uh, our encrypt service that has some code, has integration with console, uh, with Thipkin to make sure that that it works with Graal. The problem with with Graal is that it takes something like three, four minutes to create this native image because Graal needs to analyze statically all your code and that takes time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify and add all the dependencies and everything really fast. I'm going to start the, um, the process to, com to create the native image and then I will go back and explain uh, everything while the image is being created, right? So if you uh, miss anything in the, last, in the next two minutes, don't worry because I will, I will go back and explain everything. So I'm going to add the dependencies, and then I need to create here a directory, metainf slash native image slash encrypt service app. And here I'm going to create an application, a file, native image dot properties. And the content will be, what is it, here. And I'm also going to annotate this with at introspected. I think I have everything. One more thing. And I'm going to add this uh, in introspection module. So we, I will go back to this in a few seconds. But then, so I'm using, um, OpenJDK 8, but to be able to create the, the image, I need to use the Graal uh, virtual machine. So the easiest way, again, to use that is using SDK Manager to, to switch between, between different um, JVMs or whatever thing. So this is the latest version, 19.00. This is the first stable version. They released something like three or four weeks ago. So SDK use Java Graal, right? And now? I'm, I'm already using Graal version, okay? It's the same one, but with, with this compiler. So now uh, I need to create Gradle W symbol. I'm going to create the fat yard for my application. This is the same fat yard that you will, or you can start uh, uh, doing Java minus jar on the name. But instead of doing this, uh, I'm going to say native image, no server, class path, and I'm going to say I want to convert this 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 jar. So take a look at this. I'm using now something like seven gigabytes of RAM, and the CPU is like this. So during this process, uh, the Graal is going to take something like six or seven gigabytes of RAM. So the CPU, the, the RAM graphic will go to more than eighty percent, and at the end of the process, all my four cores will go to hundred percent. So as I said, this will take something like two three minutes. So Let's keep it here and let me explain what I did. So I added uh, the, this dependency that this substrate VM is the project inside this Graal umbrella that makes sure that you can convert or, uh, your applications to native images. And I'm adding this uh, micro Graal integration, which is running on annotation processor scope, which means that this code will be executed while your code is compiled. And this, this uh, module will generate all the meta information that, micro, that Graal needs to convert your application to a native image. Uh, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, everything is already there inside the framework for you to use it. 
Then I created this file inside this meta inf native image directory. And here I only define three things. Uh, the logback configuration, my application configuration, the name of the binary, encrypt service. This is the same name that you can see here. This is the name of the binary that is going to be created. And the entry point, the main class, which is this one, because Graal will start analyzing all my code, all my dependencies, starting from this main, main entry point. And then what I did was added that this added introspective annotation. So this annotation, what it's doing is uh, creating meta information at compile time again to make sure that the framework can uh, instantiate this bin and use setters and getters without using reflection at all, because we don't want to do that. And then I here, what I did was enabling this bin introspection model, because we have created a um, Jackson by default use reflection a lot. So what we did, we created a new, a new module for Jackson that uses all this meta information that the uh, at introspective annotation um, creates to make sure that we can uh, serialize our pollos to, to JSON without using uh, any kind of runtime reflection, right? And then here, uh, I'm starting the process. Uh, no server is because I don't want to start a, a process on the background to create the native image, and then only the class path, right? So you can see here now 13 gigabytes of RAM. All my four cores are 100%. It's going to finish pretty soon. So all these things that I did manually uh, will be there for you if you create the application with, uh, with the right, with the Graal feeder. So you can see now I have all my memory back, I have my cores back, and it took uh, something like almost uh, three minutes to convert this application. But the nice thing is I have I have a binary, 62 megabytes of binary, that I can run without any external dependency, right? So the, the jar of this application is something like, I don't know, um, 10 megabytes or even less, 14, right? But for be able to, to run this, you need the JVM, which is something like 100 and something megabytes. This is, uh, this is all you need to run uh, your native image. You don't need anything else because everything is already contained in this binary. So what I'm going to do is I can start it, and as you can see, bam, it's instantaneous. It only took 70 milliseconds, seven, sorry, 61 milliseconds, and this was pretty slow. I've seen something like 18 milliseconds or 20. It'll start again on a random port. It registered itself in console, so everything should work as expected. I can say here, Hello from Graal, right? 2978, which is the same one. So this is the application that is uh, responding that request. And if we go to, um, to Thipkin, we can try to find probably this one. Yeah, hello from Graal, right? So this is the application. Uh, so as you can see, using Graal, you can, you can achieve amazing fast startup. And even, even, uh, even with that, you saw that it took, in this case, 1.7 milliseconds. Uh, uh, this laptop is almost three years old, so in your new fancy laptops, it will take around one second or even less. But even, even with that, even if the application takes 100, sorry, 1.7 seconds, with Graal, it took only 61, which is just a blink, right? It's two orders of magnitude less, something like that. And uh, one, one note is that, uh, Please keep in mind that Graal is still some kind of experimental. Even if they release the first stable version, it's still experimental. Uh, they break some things sometimes. Uh, we are working with them to make sure that Micronaut works pretty well with, with, with Graal. And uh, the other thing is that at this moment, uh, I'm using Linux. You, you, can, you can create a native image with, with uh, Mac. And in this 19 version uh, release, they add experimental support for Windows. Uh, but another approach that you can use, remember this application I created here, another thing that we provide in this application is this Docker file. So if you don't have, um, if you don't have, or if you don't want to install Graal on your laptop, you can always use Docker to build, to create the, um, the image. So you, you have the latest version, you create, and you run the native image inside that Docker container, and then this is a multi-step Docker file we just use that binary using this small Alpine CGLibc oh, 
um, image, which is really, really tiny. So you can use this to run your applications. Just probably, if you are using Docker now, it's the same. It doesn't matter if you, you, if you do this because it's a binary, or you do here instead of this, you define your entry point, Java minus jar, uh, and, and the jar, right? So uh, that was all. So as a summary, uh, Micronaut is a framework for creating uh, microservices, or not only microservices, with Java, Groovy, and Kotlin, the, main, the three main languages for the ABM. For Java and Kotlin, we use a notation processor to create all this meta information at compile time. For Groovy, we use uh, AST transformations. Uh, Micronaut is natively cloud native. I show you how to use uh, uh, externalized uh, discovery service with console, distributed tracing, uh, how to use, uh, in this case, Graal, and, and you saw a lot of the features that we provide out of the box for you, so you don't need to worry about anything. Uh, we use the same dependency injection model that we love. We've been using Spring for a lot of time. Grails is built again on top of Spring, Spring Boot. So we love that kind of mechanism of dependency injection. So we use the same, we did the same thing, but we did everything or we do everything ahead of time, uh, doing this ahead of time compilation without reflection, without anything like that. One of the features or one of the benefits that you get doing this without runtime proxies is that when you have a, an a stack trace, uh, in, for example, in a Spring, you can see a lot of con, sun, miss, proxy, whatever, because there are a lot of proxies involved. In Micronaut, the traces are, are, are just uh, not that long because there are no proxies at all. And, and the other benefit is that the integration with GraalVM, which doesn't fit really, really well with, with runtime classes, uh, dynamic class loading, and all that stuff, it works, but you need to tell Graal how to do pretty much everything because it doesn't know about it. So it's pretty simple to, to run Micronaut with, with Graal. We've been supporting Graal since release candidate six. The last release candidate was 17, I think, or 16. And then we released this 19.00, which is the first uh, stable version. Uh, you also saw uh, this fast startup and low memory consumption. Even running the application inside the IDE, well, the, the startup time was fast. And running inside Graal is even faster. And at the end, uh, developers are happy, are productive, and they can focus only on, on, on the business logic and the business problem that they need to focus and do not fight uh, with the tool or with the framework or whatever. So these are uh, useful resources. The first one is the Micronaut web page. Second one, the documentation. There are links to the different modules. So this is some kind of the entry point for everything in the documentation. Uh, third one is the GitHub project. And, and the fourth one, guides.micronaut.io. In that, uh, in that web page, you will find something like 60, 75 guides that will show you how to do something with Micronaut in something like 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, all the guides have a repository with a working code. So if you want to learn how to use um, distributed tracing with Jagger, with Zipkin, security with JWT, uh, using JPA, uh, uh, creating your first Micronaut application, a lot of things. You can go there and, and you can follow the guide and, and use the repo as, a, as an example. So everything is, is, is there. We, we try to publish guides uh, very often. And the last one, if you know about the Slack, we use Gitter, which is pretty much the same. Uh, all the development team is there. So if you have any question, any feedback, whatever, you can go there and, and we, we will be happy to help you. And I think that's all. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, I, the, the code is already on, on my GitHub account and the slides. I will tweet about them. And if you have something like 30, 30 seconds, please go to that URL, bit.ly jprime or that, or that QR code. It's an anonymous Google form to send me some feedback about the talk. It will only took you something 30 seconds uh, because there are four questions. It's anonymous. You can say anything you want. If you like the talk, let me know. If you didn't like the talk, also let me know. Uh, I won't be offended. You can say anything you want. Remember, it's anonymous. And I think that's all. I have here uh, stickers and buttons, so you can grab any of them now after the talk. And I think we have something like 35 seconds for our questions. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Yep. Okay, um, is there a way to inspect the generated code? Is there a way to inspect the generated code? Uh, you can, I mean, we generate uh, Java classes, so you can take a look at them if you want. They are, uh, they are here. Um, in the build classes, you can see 
All these classes are generated, the fallback, uh, the client. So you can take a look, but probably it won't be too useful. Uh, it's probably it's better to take a look at the code that generates that, that code. But yeah, you can, you, can, you can do that. Okay, so you can grab the stickers. Thank you very much.